let's look at the big picture for performing Bayesian inference. There's essentially three steps that you need to go through in the process that you might actually need to iterate many times in practice. Step number one is to set up a full probability model. Practically speaking, what this means is you need to decide on a data generating process or a likelihood function and also describe your initial beliefs about the unobservable quantities in your model. In other words, construct a prior distribution. Second, you need to use those probability distributions to determine the posterior distribution, which is the distribution of your estimates conditional on the observed data. Lastly, after you've constructed your posterior distribution, you need to evaluate the fit of your model to the data. In other words, perform a sanity check that your model adequately describes the behavior of the observed data. Double check your assumptions. Is there a more realistic or useful model to fit? How sensitive are your results to the probability model that you set up? After considering that third step, it may cause you to go back and change some of the initial steps and re reiterate through the process. Let's talk a little bit more about the notation we're going to use to describe the various components of our Bayesian model. A, a parametric statistical analysis models the random process that produces our data, y, conditional on some unknown parameters which we are denoting by theta. In a Bayesian context, we're going to use very specific terms to describe the different distributions we're going to, going to be working with. P of y given theta is known as the data distribution or likelihood function. This is the model that we believe produced the data conditional on the model parameters and possibly some covariates. P of theta is going to, be, going to be used to denote the prior distribution about our vector of model parameters. P of y is going to denote the marginal distribution of y. This is obtained by taking the joint distribution of y and theta, and then depending on whether the joint distribution is continuous or discrete, integrating or summing the joint distribution over the support of theta. The next distribution that we're going to talk about is very important, and that is P of theta given y, which is known as the posterior distribution. It's one of the main distributions that we seek in Bayesian statistics, and that's closely followed by the posterior predicted distribution, P of y tilde given y. We'll talk more about both of these in a moment. But one of the things I want to point out is that both of these distributions that we're interested in learning about in Bayesian statistics, the posterior distribution and the posterior predictive distribution, are in fact both distributions. In frequentist statistics, we're usually after point estimates or point estimators and possibly the standard error associated with those things. But the quantities of interest in frequentist statistics are not in fact distributions, whereas in Bayesian statistics they are. At this point, you may be wondering exactly how we apply Bayes' rule in performing Bayesian inference. And the key ingredient is to treat both the observed data y and the parameter vector theta as being random. We have to give them distributions. After doing that, we can apply Bayes' rule in performing Bayesian inference. The distribution of theta that we consider is the prior distribution, which describes our initial beliefs about the distribution of our parameter vector. This can be a very vague distribution if we don't know much about the parameter vector ahead of time, or it can be more compact or specific if we have some expert opinion to guide our beliefs. The data distribution is going to describe our beliefs about the process that generated the data if in fact we knew what the parameter vector theta actually was. Using these two distributions allows us to construct the joint distribution of y and theta, p of y given theta, by taking the data distribution and multiplying it by the prior distribution. The last ingredient that we need is the marginal distribution of y, which is obtained by taking the joint distribution of y and theta and either summing over the values of theta, if that's a discrete distribution, or integrating over theta if the, the theta parameter is a continuous random variable. Once we have the data distribution, the prior distribution for theta, and the marginal distribution of y, we can obtain the posterior distribution, p of theta given y, by taking the product of the data distribution and the prior distribution and then dividing by the marginal distribution of y. One of the things to note in the previous formula for the posterior distribution on the last slide is that the marginal distribution of y in the denominator is actually a constant because it's actually the distribution of the data evaluated at the observed values of y. Since it's a constant, we can usually ignore it when we're deriving our posterior distribution since we know that the posterior distribution has to integrate to one. Thus, it's common to simply say that the posterior distribution is proportional to the data distribution multiplied by the prior distribution 
and ignore the scaling constant related to the marginal distribution of y evaluated at the observed data points. Let's talk a little bit more about the various distributions we're interested, interested in deriving. The posterior distribution, what does it actually represent? Well, it describes mathematically our updated beliefs about the distribution of our parameter vector theta after seeing the data. We initially start with some beliefs, describe our prior distribution, but then after seeing the data, we update our beliefs, which is represented by the posterior distribution. The marginal distribution of y is sometimes known as the prior predictive distribution. The word prior is thrown in because it's not conditional on observed data, and it's a predictive distribution because it is a distribution for a quantity that is observable. The posterior predictive distribution, p of y tilde given y, is our beliefs, of, our beliefs about the observable quantity y tilde after observing the data. Note that this distribution automatically accounts for any uncertainty in our parameter vector theta, the unobservable model parameters. It's called the posterior because it is conditional on the observed data, and it's also called predictive because it is a distribution for an observable quantity. The posterior predictive distribution can be a pretty mystifying quantity when you first start Bayesian statistics, so I have a set of inequalities here to try to demystify it to some extent. On line one, starting with the notation for the posterior predictive distribution, we reverse the process of integrating theta out of the joint posterior distribution of y tilde and theta. On line two, we use the properties about conditional distributions to rewrite the joint posterior distribution of y tilde and theta as the product of the conditional distribution of y tilde conditioned on theta and y multiplied by the posterior distribution of theta. That last step may seem a bit mysterious. If that's the case, just imagine writing the joint distribution of y tilde and theta as the product of the conditional distribution of y tilde given theta multiplied by the prior distribution p of theta. This follows pretty straightforwardly from the, general, the typical rules about conditional distributions. The fact that we're conditioning on the observed data y in each of these statements doesn't change any of the usual probability rules. And so I can take all of these probability distributions, condition each one of them on y, and the probability equality would still hold. Now let's get back to our set of equalities here. If we move between the second and third lines, we see that the only thing that we've done here is drop the dependence of this distribution on y. The reason for that is that we can typically assume that re each realization from the data distribution is independent of every other realization from the data distribution, assuming you know the value of theta. In fact, even if this isn't true, the math on lines one and two is still going to work, but you can't simplify in the third line. However, this process right here, this set of equalities gives us a way to simulate data from our posterior predictive distribution. First, you draw a sample realization of theta from the posterior distribution, then conditional on the value of theta that you just drew, you draw a new observation from your data distribution. And we're going to use this quite frequently as we do Markov chain Monte Carlo methods in the future. A last detail I wanted to point out is that a claimed advantage of Bayesian statistics is that it obeys something called the likelihood principle which essentially states that if two samples of data have the same likelihood function, then they should yield the, yield the same inference for theta. In frequent statistics, the process that generates the data directly affects your inference for theta, even if two processes have the same likelihood. So for example, if a negative binomial and binom binomial distribution had the same likelihood, they would still have different means and their associated confidence intervals would also differ. Bayesian statistics does not have that property. As long as two models have the same likelihood function, they should in fact have the exact same statistical inference. I'm not actually convinced that this is an advantage for Bayesian statistics, but it is a nice property to point out.